this uh, second webinar hosted by the Global D1. Our attendants gather from various countries, France, Greece, Italy, Turkey, of course, but as far as India. So I, I wish to welcome everybody. The Global D1 is an international business club located in three European capitals, Paris, Berlin, and London, but focusing on the Middle East, Maghreb, and Gulf countries, connecting East-West leaders, as our motto says. Turkey is, of course, at the heart of our concerns, and the brand Global D1 speaks clearly to our Turkish friends, I know that. So today, we will mostly debate on business and economic matters. How Turkey plays its role or not as a bridge between Europe and the Middle East. With which advantages for entrepreneurs to invest in Turkey or to trade with Turkey? Which legal framework to secure foreign companies and which sectors are more profitable? To answer those questions in one hour and 15 minutes, the Global D1 is happy to welcome a panel of high level experts. The bios were on the invitation. The audience can send us questions. We will be happy to answer during 15 minutes by the end of this webinar. To begin with, I want to pay a friendly tribute to lawyer Ali Gouden. At the first, at the very launch of the Global D1, he was the first to contact us and wishing to become a member. Will be thanks to him and to Muhammad and Mehmet for attending this webinar. So first of all, I wish to give the floor to Ambassador Maurice Gordo Montagne, member of our advisory board, former General Secretary of the Quai till last year. He is a connoisseur of European diversity and of Middle East complexity. Maurice, you were in charge besides President Chirac when Turkey started to discuss with the European Union. You will give all of us insight and perspective on our introducing question. Is Turkey still a bridge between Europe and the Middle East? Why do we need to keep Turkey with us? Maurice, I give you the floor. Thank you very much, Eric, for giving me the floor. And I would like to say how happy I am to, to be in, at that seminar with uh, Turkish uh, partners and friends, as Turkey, to answer your question, is more than ever a bridge between Europe and, I would say, the regions eastern from Europe. I would say the continents even eastern from Europe. I would like to greet all the colleagues here around the table and also all the ones who are listening to us. I must say we need a Turkish, I would say, view and approach uh, more than ever um, because uh, the world is changing. And I remember the last talks I had with my counterpart, Vice Minister uh, Kai Maxi in uh, Paris, were so interesting, uh, interesting to me as he was uh, Turkish ambassador to Iraq, Turkish ambassador to Libya, that I learned a lot from him. So I think we have a, le a lot to learn from each other because our relationship between the EU and Turkey is a very ancient one, let's say 500 years back uh, since the fall of Constantinople. It has been always a, a complex relationship, a relationship very subtle in which we have to find out ways and means to find point of equilibrium, point of balance between Turkey and Europe and the rest around. Relations with, uh, with Turkey is, uh, is key because by every time we are um, going ahead, uh, we have Turkey as a sort of stakeholder, not shareholder, a stakeholder of Europe for its own balances. Turkey as a major contributor to the equilibrium in the Middle East and also towards Central Asia. So that's the view we have from Europe. Of course, this relationship has been dictated uh, and has been as known unfoldings uh, because of history, 
and because of geography. Uh, we are neighbors and the vicinity of each other will remain forever. So we have to work together. We have to work together in the past, in the, let's say in the 19th and 20th century, of course, Turkey was embarked in the European conflicts as Europe was dominating the world. And as far as the consequences took place, uh, let's remember the, 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 the sad consequences of the, the end of uh, World War I. And now I know we are coming to some commemorations in Turkey, but also glorious commemorations of new and modern Turkey, which is for the European still a, a model a pattern, a, a success, and uh, which uh, the Europeans admire very much. The, the Turkey uh, set up by uh, uh, Mustafa Kemal. This uh, relationship has been consolidated after first world, Second World War uh, in the field of security, because Turkey brought a, an, an exceptional contribution to the security of the whole Western continent of Europe uh, towards uh, the bloc of the Soviet Union. And so uh, Turkey remains as a major uh, contributor to security of Europe beyond that period uh, of communism, which is now over as everyone knows. So we have now uh, the fundamentals, history, geography, uh, look, uh, research of an equilibrium and global security. These are the fundamentals. We must work on that. And the, the thing is that we are now, take, must, we must take now into account the fact that the world is not the one of the 19th and 20th century. We are now in a global world. And we must see how uh, the EU and Turkey together can work together in this global world. A global world which is called multipolar, multipolar world, but doesn't mean that uh, this world is uh, uh, organized yet. So um, the time of the domination of the West is over. The time of domination of, of the hegemony of any other one is also over. How do we organize ourselves? Let's look at the world as it is. The US are withdrawing, withdrawing, disengaging from, all, from most of their commitments we are allies, uh, the Turkey and the EU, to the Americans. But we know that this general trend has been confirmed by the Trump administration, and this will go ahead. We have the rise of China, a rise, economic, economical rise, military rise, soft power may be another matter. We have uh, Russia, which is a major uh, partner to all of us, because China has shown, uh, Russia has shown its resilience and has shown that it has come, <clears throat> come back uh, on the international stage and being there, hence uh, uh, an unavoidable partner. We have Europe. Europe in this global world, Europe with all its achievements, with all its successes, the single market, means of solidarity being deployed across the continent, <clears throat> um, common policies, trade and agriculture in particular, but also lots of difficulties, the East-West divide in the, in the EU. We, the, the, no, the, the question of budget, the, the question of the European, the EU identity, and who are we, Europeans? Where are our borders? This is, these are difficult things to, to, deal with, to deal with. But we have also, and let's not forget, in the EU, a capability to bounce back, as, at, as, as it had been shown uh, during the, 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 the coronavirus crisis, when uh, President Macron and Chancellor Merkel passed the agreement in the 18th of May to put together some means to bounce back and uh, launch again our economies. And we know that the Commission has followed up. So Europe is going ahead through crisis. In this context, which I tried to describe briefly, Turkey has a key role to play in our view. We are Europeans. The Turks are at our, border, at our borders. They are part of it, even if not in. And so Turkey has a pivotal role uh, on which we must work uh, together. Turkey is uh, crucial for us also in the Mediterranean. Uh, we have no EU without Mediterranean. All the EU countries have, for, in the south part of it, uh, borders with Mediterranean. And in the Eastern Mediterranean, Turkey has, of course, a role to play, which we must take into account. Now, the general context institutionally between the EU and Turkey is, as we know, at a stalemate. 
Uh, we have lots of political problems. I will just mention them. I will not deal with them because it's not the purpose of our webinar, but we have uh, the Kurdish issue, we have the, and the Syrian war. We have Libya now. We have the migration, migration issue. Uh, we have uh, a few issues within NATO. Um, all these issues are having their, their way on the institutional relationship we have. When I say institutional relationship between EU and Turkey, it means the negotiations. It started in 2005. As you said, Eric, I attended all these negotiations uh, which took place between President Chirac and Chancellor Schroeder with, at the time, President Gül and then Pre uh, Prime Minister Erdogan, plus uh, Ahmed Davutoglu, uh, at the time, the diplomatic advisor to uh, President Gül. And uh, we, we saw from that moment that it would be difficult. There was a will to go ahead, both sides, but for various reasons, we, it stalled. We couldn't go further. The last uh, report uh, of the European Commission says that there have been some progresses. Um, uh, for instance, uh, regarding the uh, integration of the communitarian acquis, regarding intellectual property, circulation of goods, financial services, there have been improvements. Uh, regarding uh, free um, circulation of capital, competitiveness, there have been setbacks. So out of 35 chapters, just to remember, to remind everyone, out of 35 chapters of negotiations, 16 have been open, one only has been closed. So we are at a stalemate. But we have also, uh, let's say, an evolution of our public opinion, which is also to take, in, to take into account and which is, uh, we said to a certain extent, accordingly uh, in, in, in every country, member country, but also in the European Parliament, clearly expressed. Uh, the, 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 the European Parliament has asked for the suspension of negotiation, though Turkey still remains a candidate, has the status of a candidate. President Macron said that uh, we should find out a new partnership. Chancellor Merkel said in 2017, Turkey must not be a member country of the EU. So we must absolutely, because of the transformation of the world, because of the world as it is, and as we need Turkey, and as Turkey needs the EU, we must get out of the stalemate. It's important to find out and to define new perspectives and to, uh, to set up new rules of the game. Uh, what could it be? What could be the, 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 the programs, the plans we could have together? Uh, the existing achievements must be absolutely preserved and uh, in a pragmatic way. First of all, we must continue having our societies be opened up to each other through means of education with the students and others. We must have also uh, further work uh, done by our by, by us on the liberalization of visas. There are 72 criteria for opening the visas, for liberalizing the visas with Turkey, out of which only seven are not yet fulfilled. We must absolutely work on it because it's through the people that contacts go ahead and that relations get deepened, not only through governments. We must work also on our convergences. Convergences in the field of security, security of the continents, East and West, uh, in the field of security, we had the uh, good achievement with the agreement on the, the Eurosam system uh, on anti-missile uh, between Thales, MBDA and Turkey. We could work further on the cyber issue, cyberspace. Um, we, have, we should share because these are the, I would say, the challenges of tomorrow on which we shall have to do to work together. We could work on our, the stability of our neighborhood stability of our neighborhood through more consultations, having in mind that one of the major uh, fights, struggles we have to go ahead is the struggle, the fight against terrorism, because terrorism has hit Turkey, terrorism has hit uh, the EU, and we must work on that. We have already convergences on Iran, for instance, regarding the nuclear, regarding GCPOA. We have uh, convergence on the US policy in the Israelo-Palestinian conflict. Um, the, trans, the, 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 trans, the, uh, the, the U.S. Embassy transferred to Jerusalem, the annexion of the West Bank, we share views. On the integrity of Iraq and the stability of Iraq, we share exactly the same point. So we have already a circle of common views. 
we could develop between the EU and, uh, and, the, and Turkey our trade. We have, the EU is already the first trade partner of uh, Turkey by 50% 50, 50 of the uh, Turkish uh, trade is done with the EU. Uh, investments could be done in, uh, in many fields. We have for that a tool, which is also a frame, and which is much better than a free trade agreement, which is the customs union. Customs union, which exists, to which Turkey belongs, and uh, uh, which exists since 1996. We could work on agriculture, we could work on services, on transport, on public markets, but we know that there are, it's blocked from, by one party or the other on these different items. Now we have also uh, the energy stakes. Energy, we know that Turkey is for the last 20 years a hub for the transportation of, uh, uh, of uh, oil, crude oil, but also for natural gas. And we know that the EU will need more and more uh, for eco ecologic transition, more and more uh, natural gas. So these are, I would say, a good basis to work ahead. Uh, we have the Cyprus issue regarding the continental shelf and regarding uh, the drillings. I am sure there, should, there could be solutions found. I went to Cyprus, I went uh, to Greece. Uh, I know that if there is a political will, there will be solutions found for that. Uh, regarding Cyprus, we had this conversation, this uh, con negotiations in Grand Montana three years ago in Switzerland between North and South, and uh, we were almost by an agreement. We didn't take place. Let's work. Let's be, uh, I would say, willing to find out the agreement. We have the instruments of pre-adhesion also, which are at our service from since uh, 2002. Uh, there were about 10 billion euros spent for pre-adhesion uh, pre in general, and 50% of it um, in favor of Turkey. Couldn't we work more on that, uh, having our legal systems be closer? That's uh, also an issue. We have the capability also to develop more links together, EU and Turkey, in Africa uh, for the transformation of Africa. EU has some skills regarding Africa, regarding infrastructure uh, development, and Turkey is very present, very present. We have noticed that Turkey is now, has now embassies in 40 countries uh, in Africa, uh, instead of 12, 20 years ago. Turkish Alliance is everywhere, which shows of a presence. So these are, I would say, tools at our disposal to work together. Now, so what I would say is that we know the fundamentals. We know that we need each other. We know that there are possible partnerships. Of course, there are political issues which have to be settled by the governments. We're working on that, but let's be willing to go ahead to find out ways and means. Uh, and I am very confident that if we want it, we can do it. And it's, the, the, it's where the, this uh, uh, seminar can bring a contribution. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maurice, very much for your brilliant analysis of the situation. Uh, I will welcome now uh, Catherine Dorniac. Uh, Catherine, as far as French companies need help and assistance, to compete on the Turkish market, BPI could probably assist them, and you will explain us how. Before joining BPI, uh, Catherine, you were uh, in charge of the Middle East for Medef International, so you have expertise. Uh, what could be a successful strategy to be in the Turkish market? What challenges have companies to face? Which sectors are promising and which are to be avoided? Thank you to you and to BPI, which is our partner uh, for this webinar, as you were for the first one on sovereign funds. Catherine, you have the floor for 10 minutes about. Thank you very much, Eric, and thank you, Maurice, for this uh, brilliant presentation indeed. What I would like to do this morning indeed is to share some insight about BPI France's strategy regarding Turkey, uh, because we are uh, not only an investment bank, but also the top but also the Sovereign Wealth Fund and the French ECA. I would like also to look at political and economic challenges that we hear back from companies in our portfolio. And third, to look at key sectors in Turkey and see where we can prioritize in the next few months and which sectors might have a bit more difficulties. 
So regarding PPI France and Turkey, there is one data to remember. It is 83 million, which is the size of the Turkish population. And we also know that 60% of the GDP is driven through consumption in the country. So just because of this information, you understand that Turkey, regardless of politics, has to be a priority for BPI France and for French companies. What we see is that Turkey has, of course, a very skilled and industrial population. So many sectors are to be relevant in, this, uh, in, in tackling the country. Regarding the key um, products that we sell in Turkey, uh, we see that it's mostly export financing and insurance. So Turkey is always in the top three in the Middle Eastern region for prospection and for insurance, meaning when we cover French contracts for goods and services. We have been very active indeed because only, well, last week or just recently, we publicized the coverage of 10 airplanes for the company Pegasus Air and the coverage of three um, aircraft engine by uh, Safran Aircraft and General Electric to Sun Express. So business is still going on definitely in Turkey. Now regarding the political and economic challenges, I don't want to go too deep into this, this issue, especially political, but we see obviously that due to the situation, it's, it is quite difficult for French company in the next few months to position themselves in bigger state contracts. Um, and it might be hard as well to get support from French industry or even French ministries uh, due, to the, due to the current situation. Regarding the economic issues, the top three uh, problematic that are brought back to me by our companies that we follow are the depreciation of the Turkish lira, the trade tariff which remain too high, and of course the impact of the COVID which are still uncertain. And due to this economic and political situation, we have to make a choice in the sectors that we choose to approach if we want to have quick wins in the next few months. And so um, I can give a, my first example would be municipalities. Uh, we all know that French companies have been very active in the municipalities um, sector uh, because it's an heritage from the 2000-2010 area where Turkey won it was uh, looking to join the EU and we had to conform to EU norms. We identified a lot of needs in rail transportation, waste management, Suez managed to get a contract there. But we also know that Izmir, Istanbul, Ankara are now run by the opposition and that there is financing issues. What we did on BPI France's side actually uh, was to pro provide a product called on lending, which managed to neutralize the financing issue because we could lend to Turkish banks who could then lend to municipalities. But we are not very sure that due to the political situation, if this technical solution we have can actually follow. So really our need is to find sector which are sub-political to be able to move quicker in the next few months again. Um, one other sector I would like to look at quickly is the automotive industry. It's always the sector which is, uh, uh, which is mentioned when um, giving an example about Turkey as a bridge between East and West indeed. We know that uh, Turkey is subcontractor for most of the automotive brand in the country. Renault has uh, factories there, one of its best ones. Toyota is there. All the equipment are there for Asia, Plex, Ticomnium, Valeo. I forget uh, many of them. Uh, but now we see that uh, due to the COVID crisis, the automobile, the automotive industry will be one uh, which will be the hardest hit. Uh, and uh, we also see that Turkey is moving toward creating a national automobile industry. They created the TAC Turkey Autonomous Club and they want to build their own car now. So uh, I can tell you that this is very happening because French companies have signed the uh, non-disclosure agreement for these projects. So it's, going, it's, it's really going on, but we see that there is a shift really in the automotive industry from constructing from other countries to now also developing your own, the Turkey's own sector. So it's something we'll have to look at, but um, which might prove a bit difficult uh, in the next few months. Now there is two sectors which I think uh, could be of interest in the next few months because they are below the political radar and because they have not been hit by COVID. And of course, I will start with health. When I think of health, I think of equipment, I think of clinics, 
especially private clinics, because um, it's a bit more complicated when you depend uh, of the, the, the Ministry of Health for the, the reason I mentioned above. We have very innovative companies in France. We are very specialists in diabetes, in all the first world disease prevention and treatment. One of the issues though is that in the health sector, the payment time is long. It can take two, up to three to five years to be paid, but uh, BPI France has some solutions to help French exporters to, 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 to recover their cash quicker. And we can of course discuss it um, if needed. And of course the COVID have accelerated the needs. And the last sector I want to look at would be the fintech sector. I mentioned just, um, just a second ago that the automotive industry was one of the most flourishing in Turkey, while the family who are managing these sectors now have opened, now have developed families of this, and they want to invest in their funds. And the funds are currently invested uh, for, for a big part of it in fintech, in finance, in everything digital. The Turkish are much more advanced than the French. Uh, I, I can tell you that uh, Ben P. Paribas, um, head of digital in Turkey, was called back actually recently to Paris to share her experience. Um, because it's clear, the, um, I think the Turkish uh, banks are the most digitalized in the EMEA region. Uh, and that the, the digital penetration is, is really tremendous in Turkey. But uh, they, there is still some applications that we can help the Turkish um, market with, uh, mobile banking, e-payment, especially contactless payment would be some uh, some area where we can find er where we can find corporations, and of course e-commerce due to the size of the market which I mentioned earlier and to the appetite. So um, just as a conclusion, uh, we see that, of course, there is political and economic difficulties regarding trade between the EU and Turkey. But our challenges, I think, would be to find sectors which are less affected by the crisis, by the political situation, in order to get some quick wins. And that's why I'm advising, but among others, of course, health and fintech and BPI France is more than ready to help everyone wanting to develop in this market. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, for your commitment and, and BPI commitments. You will have the, the floor again at the end of the, the panel to, to share some more ideas. I'm now very happy to welcome uh, Mohamed Demir. Uh, Mohamed is, uh, works in London as an investment banker and is also a famous anchor uh, journalist for business program on EcoTurk for the Turkish audience. He has a PowerPoint presentation everybody could get after the webinar, and Mohamed will explain with facts and figures the competitivity, the attractiveness of the Turkish economy. Mohamed, you have 10 minutes maximum to convince our audience to invest and trade with Turkey. I give you the floor. Uh, thanks a lot, Derek. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, actually, uh, it's a really fast-changing environment globally for all the countries and uh, all the companies who are trying to do a business. Uh, I would like to, I, I won't go into politics much uh, as uh, our uh, other panelists went uh, already into that. I'll just go through the numbers to see what we can do in Turkey. Basically, when you invest in uh, any sector or any business, you, you need to have your competitive advantages, what you would have over there as a differentiating factor from the other investments. When you come to Turkey, the young population is the main driver here. We have been talking about this young population of Turkey for decades now. But uh, in terms of numbers, if you look at it, it's 11 years younger than the European average. And when you just take the uh, size of the population in Turkey into account as well, that's a big, big factor to be able to you know, invest in Turkey and get some affordable labor over there as well. And the population is increasingly getting skilled and uh, getting high education, uh, which is the baccalaureate degree uh, here. We, we had 73 uh, universities in Turkey back in 2000. Uh, 2000. Now uh, we have more than 206 universities in Turkey, which shows the uh, increase in the quality of the workforce as well. Also, Turkish people are, Turkish professionals are, uh, they used to work really long weekends, including, uh, including the uh, Saturday. It's, it's a convention in Turkey where we don't have it in the UK or in Europe. 
but uh, it doesn't just decrease their efficiency. They are just used to it. Every country or every nation has their way of, you know, different uh, way of working uh, professionally. So that, that are positive advantages in terms of uh, human capital. When we come to the uh, banking system, financial system, because Turkey had a really bad experience back in 2000, we had a financial crisis before Western world, Turkish government took necessary steps to make sure that the banks are healthy, financial system is healthy, and they have established uh, several authorities and agencies to regulate banking uh, system, to regulate the financial system, so that uh, they won't go down like Lehman did back in the day. So all these uh, banks and uh, their balance sheets, they're well, much better than uh, European counterparts and uh, MENA region. Also, uh, these reforms are still helping the uh, Turkish banks to go through this crisis, despite the COVID uh, pandemic and uh, even in the uh, subprime crisis in 2008. Also, uh, Turkey is a, fa a favorite uh, destination for foreign direct investment. The type of the investors or who invests in Turkey changes. Uh, as you have mentioned before, the uh, investments from Europe may have declined, but it has been replaced by other investors such as Middle East and China. So actually it's a, a game of balance and adaptability as well, because uh, in the game of uh, economics, there's, there are no sides. You just uh, look at your profits and your uh, efficiency. When we uh, come to the government, you may like it or not, it's a very investor-friendly government. They welcome all the international investors. They give full access to real estate. They're, they're part of international arbitration. If you have any problems with uh, any company or the government over there, and they have uh, investment support uh, and promotion agency. These are government agencies to help the investors in Turkey. Also, especially, just like Catherine mentioned, if you want to invest in R&D or digital sector, there are tax deductions and social security premium exemptions. Uh, recently, there, there was a game company which was sold for $1.8 uh, billion. Uh, it, was, it was one of the biggest uh, unicorn investments in Turkey. So this shows how uh, big it is getting in Turkey in terms of uh, foreign direct investments. Also, Turkey has uh, either uh, from uh, ethnic background uh, with the Middle East, uh, with Turkey countries, or its uh, Ottoman background, or from its uh, vicinity to the different countries because it has seven neighbors anyway. It has extensive reach in the countries uh, that, that we uh, put on our, our presentation, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, these are the Turkey countries. Bosnia shares the same heritage in uh, Ottoman and uh, religious wise. And uh, Bulgaria and Georgia are the small countries around Turkey, which do a lot of business. And many Turkish companies are doing a lot of business with these countries. So you can use their expertise and experience when you want to go into any joint ventures in these countries. When we come to the consumers in Turkey, they are very consumers uh, when it comes to the middle class. They love to spend on consumer electronics, uh, uh, say it, uh, the computers, say it, the smartphones. Although the purchasing power is much lower than Europe, they would just go and buy it, even if it uh, takes them a couple of years to pay it back. And also, because the transportation is not uh, as good as public transport is not as good as uh, Europe, people rely on cars. So cars are much more expensive, including their taxes as well. It's almost a luxury item in Turkey. And just like Catherine mentioned, uh, many of the car manufacturers have, uh, have plants in Turkey, manufacturing plants in Turkey, uh, which are almost all the car brands in the world. When we come to the uh, sectors to invest, basically, uh, energy is one, uh, one of the major sectors especially renewable energy and greener energy, which is supported by EBRD as well, uh, European Bank of Research and Development. And uh, in terms of solar uh, and wind maps, Turkey is among the best uh, countries in the world. It has geothermal energies thanks to its uh, geographic location. And we expect that 130 billion euros will be needed to invest in the energy sector in the next 10 years, next decade, because Energy is the biggest uh, item in Turkey's budget deficit. 
which ha has been a big headache for Turkey for many years and looks like it will be in the years to come. Also, tourism is very important in Turkey. Uh, just like our panelists uh, uh, mentioned, including the health tourism, Turkey is the seventh biggest destination in the world. Although Turkey is like in G20 and tourism is very famous in uh, smaller countries or uh, maybe uh, the countries close to the Ekaida, uh, which are very warm and hot, Turkey differentiates itself in terms of service, in terms of location, in terms of the diversity as well that it offers to the uh, tourists. Istanbul and Antalya are the third and fourth most visited cities in Europe, which may come as a surprise to many of our, uh, our uh, viewers, because uh, even for me, when I found out that Antalya was the fourth biggest uh, city uh, visited in Europe, I was surprised because that, that's a big statement. Uh, it's just like, you know, Egypt, but not Egypt. It's like Greece, but not Greece. Just like uh, we put it here, it's the bridge between East and West. You get the best of both worlds. Also, uh, it was a very big uh, destination for convention tourism. But uh, obviously with the COVID-19, it's the same anywhere. We don't have any conventions, hence there is no convention tourism. But uh, the other thing is thermal springs. Uh, we know from Iceland and other countries, this is a big uh, area, but Turkey is underutilized when it comes to these kind of uh, investments. Also, uh, infrastructure uh, investments will be a big item in, in the next decade coming. We expect around 60 billion euros of investment due to rapid industrialization in Turkey. So solid based management, supply potable water, water treatment, based water, sewage or power distribution are the fields that would need investment in the coming years. And uh, obviously if it's a government uh, contract, you may have some uh, barriers just like Catherine uh, mentioned, but at the same time, the, you shouldn't only see it as, as a governmental uh, project that, that you should go into in Turkey. Turkey is a capitalist market, free market as well. There are quite a few companies that you can go and have a partnership with. On the other side, the, in the natural stone, Turkey is the fourth largest producer in the world and 40% of the global marble reserves are in Turkey. Obviously, Turkey has other uh, natural resources uh, in terms of having the bigger share like Forex, but when it comes to marble, it's used by all, all around the world, all the countries, and it's a luxury item, as far as I know, from uh, London. But the problem is we have China in between who is just buying it all, processing it, selling it back to Europe. And uh, sometimes you have lose-lose, sometimes win-win uh, situations. Here, Europe is losing, France is losing, Turkey is losing, Chinese is winning. Uh, I think there can be a win-win situation where, uh, you know, both countries should go into these uh, joint ventures in these uh, sectors so that everyone wins. And in this fast changing environment uh, in international relations and economics and uh, you know, government uh, policies, I think uh, it's, it's important to be adaptable for any kind of investor, to be ready to go and invest and uh, look for new opportunities. And uh, there is a saying in French, savoir, uh, savoir. I think like when there is a will, there is a way. So both for European Union or investments or other things, if we want to find a solution, we will find a way. Hope that uh, it will help all our investors and viewers. Thank you, Mohamed. You are a very, very good salesman. Uh, now it's the turn of Ali Gooden. Uh, Ali Gooden, you are a lawyer in Istanbul, but also in London by the London Bar. You are a specialist in commercial and corporate law. Uh, you prepared a PowerPoint, but uh, we decided not to share it now, but we will send it to, the, to our audience after the webinar. Uh, could you tell us in a few minutes how can European or others secure their investments in Turkey? Is there any breach in the rule of law or risks limited? Ali, you have the floor for 10 minutes maximum. I know you, you have a lot to say. Yes, I do. Um, uh, thank you for a kind introduction. And, and before I start thinking my technical legal 
um, presentation, I like to say a couple of things about you Turkey relations. Um, and I like to thank you, first of all, for the ambassador, uh, Maurice, about kind wishes um, for the relationship for the Europe and Turkey. Um, the Turkish relationship with the EU officially starts 1963 with the Ankara Agreement, um, when the European Community Agreement is called. And then, um, and, and we have, uh, we continue to have a special relationship. And 2005, Turkey become a candidate member and the, and the starts, I mean, Maris already summarized all the relationship anyway, but it's very important for us. As a modern Turk, I want to say, we still want a full membership, but we are still happy with a special relationship as well. We need some sort of, um, uh, fundamentally we need it, Turkey and the Europe. Um, I'm still fan of full membership, but uh, of course there are a number of things to be done this is my personal view I just want to share with you before going to do um, legal technical stuff. Um, and today I want, I'm going to talk about um, a legal aspect of uh, doing business in Turkey. Um, and, be, uh, the, and the first of all, I want to talk about why invest in Turkey. Mohammed already mentioned about uh, advantages of doing business in Turkey. Be, Turkey is a large domestic and regional market. We know about the strategic location and skilled and cost competitive and young labor co force. And we know about the liberal investment climate despite some political issues and some barriers. Um, and we know there is no barrier for the foreign direct investors. And we know about the protection for investors and some new investment opportunities. These are the advantages of uh, doing business in Turkey and why investing in Turkey. But we, there are also barriers, of course, and the problems and issues um, that, that I wanted to talk about. There are like problems to find uh, English speakers when you go out from the big cities, if you want to do business outside of Istanbul and, or Ankara and Izmir, there are some difficulties of finding skilled English speakers people. Um, this is one of the, one of the, I think the problem, let's say disadvantages. The other one is like um, the cost of setting up a company, slightly uh, higher cost uh, comparing to UK and, and, and Europe. And of course there are some uh, bureaucracy that get involved as well because this, Turkey is a civil law country uh, and there are some bureaucratic barriers sometimes we have. And, and also the, 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 the corruption and bribery is a still problem in Turkey when you do business. So you need to be careful. These are the problems that I want to mention uh, after Mohammed giving uh, a, a perfect weave about doing business in Turkey. So, um, and then I want to talk about uh, what is what we have in terms of Turkish legal system, what we have here. Turkey has got a secular legal system, which is uh, administrative law is adopted from the French legal system, by the way, uh, mainly. And we also have a civil law and uh, it's adopted from German civil law, which is modern, is adopted the, uh, after the Republic. And we are a member of NATO, United Nations, European Union, Custom Union, so on, so on. We also have a number of bilateral trade agreements with uh, European countries and also outside Europe. So um, these are, uh, and we, uh, it's giving, uh, and there are a number of legal protection for foreign investors to do business in Turkey. Uh, the, the one of them is if you, of course, uh, there are, difficulties I have to mention here, the Turkish court procedure, I mean, traditional court procedure I'm talking about, I guess you have a similar uh, system in, in France and traditional courts are a little bit delay, uh, you know, the process are uh, uh, complicated sometimes. And we have the similar problem in Turkey when you have a dispute in, in Turkey. And, and, and there are also criticism about independency of Turkish court. But having said that, and we also have arbitration, which is available for foreign investors. 
Um, I mean, if you have a, if you are doing business in Turkey, and if you have a, a partnership agreement, if you have a joint venture agreement, and so on, you can have an arbitration clause, and you can take this matter to the arbitration if you don't trust Turkish court. So you have an alternative to deal your dispute outside the court, and you have an independent and uh, uh, decision uh, outside the court system, and you can enforce that arbitration decision in Turkey uh, as Turkey is party of the Tur uh, New York Convention of uh, Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards. And also Turkey, uh, the, uh, the ICSID, which is International Center of Settlement of Investment Dispute Convention, is another convention as Turkey is a party. So you if you have any issues like this, so you can uh, have, you can, uh, you can take uh, matter to the arbitration to resolve your dispute. Um, these are instruments which is available for uh, for an investor uh, to protect their interest in Turkey. So how about establishing business in Turkey? Um, it, the, setting up a business in Turkey is, uh, is easy. You can do that. You can set up a company within a day. Uh, it, Conditions applied to international investors are the same as local investors. So international investors may establish any form of company set out in Turkish commercial court. And that Turkish commercial court, which is moder modernized very recently, offers corporate governance approach that meets international standards and fosters the private equity and public offering activities. And establishing a business is carried out trade registry office located at the Chamber of Commerce. And now these days is available online. So we can set up the company by an online application. It's easy. The, how the steps and the steps to establish a company is to choose the business structure first. And we need to prepare the documents, apply the license and permits and register for tax purposes and obtain the company seal and so on. These are the standard procedures for setting up a business in Turkey. And uh, there are a number of, of course, um, incentives uh, these days uh, for, uh, for, for, for if you're a foreign investor, if you want to do business in Turkey, some, some sorts of uh, uh, incentives is also available. What type of corporate forms is available? As joint stock company, limited liability companies are the, the most common use companies types that can be used in Turkey. And, uh, and these are even one person can form or one person, I mean the legal person or legal entity or natural person can form that type of companies. Uh, it used to be it's more complicated, as I said, it's modernized very recently. Um, there are other types of companies, but they are not really uh, popular. Uh, uh, these are limited company and also uh, uh, joint stock companies are the common one and uh, joint stock companies are more favorable because it's easy to transfer the shares if you want to have other shareholders to join your company in the later stage. So uh, therefore we recommend make, uh, mostly the, uh, the joint stock company for the uh, foreign investors. And um, there are investment zones and the, uh, the, the, uh, the technology development zones. These are the des uh, areas that designate to attract investments in the high technology fields. And they have also their own special rules, as, I, as Mohammed mentioned and Catherine mentioned about to some incentives. Uh, they have some incentives available in that zones and organized industrial zones and that allow companies to operate within an in in investor friendly environment. And we also have some free zones that are designed to boost the number of export focused investments. So these are the um, uh, important tools when as a foreign investor, if you want to come and invest in, uh, in Turkey. Um, my, I, I, I try to summarize my, my, uh, my uh, presentation as uh, quickly as possible. Uh, I mean, these are very technical stuff. I don't want to go into do in deep in details, of course. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm happy to uh, answer the question if the audience have any questions about the Turkish legal system at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Ali, <coughs> for sharing with patience your convictions. It's also interesting. Uh, now I will give the, the floor to our last panelist, 
Mehmet Ogutsu, you are the chairman of the London Energy Club, Mehmet, and of the Bosphorus Energy Club. You are a former Turkish diplomat. You have a broad and international and global vision. And I would like to ask you your comments about uh, the, the previous panelists have asserted and maybe some key ideas you want to share with us now. Mehmet, you, you have the floor. Thank you, Eric. First of all, I'd like to also commend the Global Divan for bringing such fine minds together in your second meeting. And uh, I think what we need between Turkey and Europe Turkey and France is meaningful, constructive channels of dialogue. I hope that Global D1 will be serving as an effective political, commercial and security uh, platform for Turks, French and the Europeans and the Middle Easterns in the region could come and talk to each other. I want to give five uh, sharp, concise messages, if I may in the next two uh, and a half hours. Uh, one is, we have to bear in mind clearly, as Morris said at his uh, opening remarks, the world has changed beyond recognition. We are no longer in the world of 10 or 15 years. France changed, EU has changed, Turkey has changed significantly, and it is a multipolar world, yes, I agree with Morris, but Clearly, there are two poles of power now, United States and China, the new superpowers, and then a great number of regional powers, more autonomous, but there is a hardening situation, tense situation between US and China. We will be forced to take sides at some point, all of us, including EU, uh, Russia already clear, have a marriage of convenience with China, but Australia, Japan, the regional powers. So in that context, we have to see Turkey and its relations with Europe in a new context. We have to have new parameters defining our relationship. So that's an opportune time in this regard. Never lose sight of the fact that whoever is in power in Turkey, whether we like them or love them or hate them, Turkey is a major power to reckon with, all the way from China to Germany, Russia, to Saudi Arabia. It's the greatest power in this geographical space. Security-wise, economy-wise, and also human resources, cultural hinterland, whatever you call it. So, Maurice mentioned about the Mediterranean being key for southern members of EU. That's true. But so is also uh, Caspian, the, also the Middle East, uh, relations with Russia, Ukraine, Southeast Europe, even all the way going to the uh, Central Asia, South Asia, and Africa, where Turkish uh, presence is growing. So it's not a country now you can deal with within the straitjacket of EU or bilateral relationship. So Turkey has to change, I agree, to work better with EU and France, but also EU and France has to change to understand how dynamics have changed in Turkey and how we can rework it between us. So we need to retool our mindset as well. With regard to EU, as uh, also our friend uh, uh, said, uh, Ali, we had a long engagement since 1963. Since then, so many countries coming late joined as accession partner member. In Turkish, we have a saying, if an engagement doesn't lead to marriage in a year or so, then the relationship are, is derailed and spoiled. Now we see that this engagement will not be converted to marriage in the foreseeable future. So we have to recognize that. We can put the blame on the EU side or Turkey, but whatever the reality is, if we keep the accession perspective at the center of our discussions, Relations will be poisoned. I advise you to look at how UK, Spain, Italy, Poland, Hungary are dealing with Turkey. Independently of EU accession process, they have excellent relationship with Turkey, bilaterally. Trade volume with UK jumped to almost 19 billion pounds in a few years. 
because political relationship were good and they understand how to deal with it because of their Commonwealth experience. France has a similar approach with Francophone. So it's not to say that Turkey is an easy partner, neither France is or EU, but we know how to deal with difficult partners as well around the world if there are mutual benefits. With regard to relations with France, I think we attach emotionally as well too much importance to uh, relationship with France. Look at Turkey, you know, Galatasaray, Saint Joseph, Saint Benoit, administrative uh, system uh, modeled along the French system. And I remember the days when I was in the Foreign Office with uh, President Chirac, and we had the golden years. Then the political elite change in France and in Turkey also, relationship started to worsen. Unfortunately, trade investment, no matter how much you try, will be affected by the state of political relationship. Hopefully, through such channels and others, we can political relations from the business, in a way, because business world, now and, uh, I wear the head of a businessman, business world can lead the way as well to improve political relations and security relationship, be in bilaterally or in Libya, in Syria, in Africa and elsewhere. I believe strongly that this can be done and, and France also, like Germany did for Central and Eastern European countries, can play a constructive role bringing Turkey closer to the EU as the leader of Club Med within the EU. Look what happened during the time of Giscard d'Estaing and Karamanlis for Greece. Although Greece didn't comply with EU acquis and criteria, it was brought in. It was a political decision. And uh, about the investment opportunities, if I could come to that very briefly, yes, the sectors mentioned already, uh, where there is a great potential for French and to work with. But don't forget that it's not one way street. It's not France only selling to Turkey or investing in Turkey, but also Turkish businesses investing in France and bringing trade to France or working together in Africa, Middle East, Mediterranean, Russia, elsewhere. So we have to see this as a two way street where there is a great potential. And Last word, perhaps, there's so much to talk, but I don't want to take much time. Perhaps, we, because in UK, we have a special group bringing together statesmen as well as the businessmen and civil society once a year, meeting rotatingly in uh, Turkey and UK. This contributed a great deal to the expansion of business, investment, trade, and the political dialogue. Non-governmental, although you have the statesmen attending, perhaps we could try to do the same thing between Turkey and France, a regular channel of dialogue for businesses, also to do business. You know, it's not only talking shop, but matchmaking and getting things done. And with these thoughts, uh, I think it is logical that we should perhaps have the next meeting in Istanbul, if you also agree. And uh, uh, Catherine mentioned a couple of sectors, Mohammed also mentioned, I would like to add defense industry in that where Turkey is flourishing. It's a major exporter of defense system products. And France is great in this area as well. We already collaborate, but there is more, I think, focus to be put on defense collaboration in addition to other big projects, which require, as Catherine said, some political relaxation in relationship. So you have to put pressure on your government. We have to put pressure on our government so that it's not only between two leaders dialogue is going on, but deep down, coming from the business, defense community, uh, as well as civil society, I think we can achieve a mutually beneficial and on equal footing, I would like to underline, equal footing relationship going forward. Otherwise, Turkey has other options now. Because of the distancing from EU and US, now Turkish relations with China, Russia, India, where the power the shifting power is there. We all recognize. So in this changing environment, I think we have to arrange the equilibrium, the right balance for which Turkey is ideally located politically, geographically and economically. Let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mehmet, to push our idea to, to have the global new one as a link between Europe and, and Turkey. And I think that together, all together, we can repair the bridge 
if there is any problem between our two countries or, or continents. We arrive to the conclusion time. We have uh, 15 minutes now before conclusion. I will give again the floor to our panelists for a short one minute final comment or recommendation. I will begin again with Catherine. If you have any comments to share with us or the ideas that raised during the, the discussion, feel free to, to express it or comment it. Thank you very much, Eric. Well, my key messages uh, to the audience is that Turkey remains a key market for us, regardless of politics, and that all the challenge in, in the next few months or year would be to find a sector which are um, autonomous uh, and away from the political level, level to go quickly. And that's why I was thinking of health and fintechs, because they're a good example, and they're not been, they have not been hit by the COVID. And definitely BPI France can help French companies uh, with financing, with insurance and so on. We have an excellent relationship with Turkish banks with, with whom we have cooperation agreements. And so Turkey remains really much on the radar. So please don't hesitate to contact us if you need any help. Mm -hmm. We will give the audience your contact for sure. Turkish uh, problems or uh, recommendation or help, of course, Catherine. Thank you again for participating to this uh, webinar. Muhammad, uh, I give you the floor again uh, to, um, to comment or to add some remarks to what you say, but that was very clear and, and very practical. Muhammad? Uh, when it comes to investment, uh, we, then, we tend not to care about the background of the you know, political views of the investment or you know, what, uh, what religion it is or where it comes. We, we should leave our emotions aside and think practically when it comes to uh, building bridges. And, uh, United States and Saudi Arabia are not the most allied countries uh, to be partners with, but when it comes to the common uh, interests, they're, they're very close to each other. So obviously there are some hard feelings between EU, France, Turkey and other regions. Obviously, as you mentioned, since the, since the you know, fall of Constantinople, but everyone, everywhere fell in the meantime. I mean, from that time to, to this time, yeah, Europe conquered each other, I don't know how many times. So yet, uh, even with the late last two world wars, uh, France and Germany were the enemies of each other, and now they're the biggest partners. So I think we should put everything aside, uh, both Turkey and uh, France having a uh, uh, history of an empire. They are very strong uh, countries with strong tradition, so we should just see the common points. We should just focus on win-win approach and uh, make this thing work, just like Mehmet said, just find common you know, uh, ground for working together, not only in terms of government, I want to underline that, in terms of private sector as well, in terms of investments from companies to companies in other countries as well. Uh, yeah, that's uh, where I will finish. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Mohamed, for your very optimistic vision we share, of course. Ali, again, uh, a few words to, to conclude the, the political and legal aspects you, you, you have mentioned during your first intervention. I would like to say COVID-19, this pandemic, taught us that we need each other. The Europe yeah. needs Turkey. The Middle East need Turkey, Turkey needs Middle East, Middle East, you know, we, not, we need each other. So this is, and we live in the same region. We are not far away, we are not China. We are Turkey, Europe, Middle East, we're in the same place. Um, and we need, we have one world, by the way, and we have one Mediterranean Sea. Um, and we need to find a way to deal with it. Um, and, and the Europe and the France should play more constructive role as Mehmet mentioned, to, as an anchor to liberalize and democracy in Turkey and the Middle East. I think this is important. And in terms of business, yes, we can do more cooperation and more collaboration together to work together. And hopefully we're going to meet in Istanbul sometimes soon and, and discuss more opportunities and hope to see you soon. Yeah, of course. Thank you for the welcome. We will, uh, we will answer your invitation. Mehmet, uh, once again, but you, you, your, your views are shared by the panelists. 
what you would like to conclude for this uh, webinar? I think I want to say just one thing, uh, leadership. I think in the world now, there is a lack of leadership. We saw that while trying to deal with COVID-19 uh, crisis. We see that in EU, there is a lack of leadership to take EU to the next level, a uh, union that is losing competitiveness and getting aged. And uh, therefore, in our relationship, we need strong leadership that should be provided by the governments, by the business community. We can always galvanize the governments if we are determined, if we see benefit there. Sometimes we are more influential as businesses than governments are and civil society. Therefore, I would like to underline that the leadership that is lacking should be brought in by the young people, entrepreneurs and young politicians uh, as well. So we should play a role in bridging uh, this gap in leadership in our countries as well as in our regions. So such platforms, I think, play a role in galvanizing uh, this issue. That's my last message. Thank you, Mehmet. So now it's the turn to, to go back to Maurice Gordo Montagne. Uh, he, take, uh, he takes notes during the speeches. I know he, he has a lot to say to, to conclude this webinar. Maurice, it's your, your turn to speak now. Oh, no, no, there's a problem. I think no. I need to guess. Oh, Maurice, Maurice you, are, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. I can only but subscribe to whatever has been said by our colleagues after this discussion. Uh, and in particular, the last point regarding leadership. We need leadership. We need leadership of a country. We need leadership of countries together. Uh, we know that in the EU, leadership has been always exerted by France and Germany together, of which it was uh, underlined that uh, we were fighting each other, having armies along the Rhine River for the last 300 years. And now we have the uh, Franco-German Brigade on the Rhine River. So this is a great achievement. Leadership can be found, provided there is a political will. I'm sure there is. And the business community, as it was rightly said uh, by Mehmet, can play its role. We, I, what I would like to, uh, to underline in particular, to stress in particular, is that we must define and shape together what will be the relation between EU and Turkey, but as quick as possible. Because COVID-19, which I didn't say any, anything, but which was mentioned by uh, many of uh, the, the panelists, COVID-19 is exacerbating tensions and accelerating the changes. And partnerships are now coming up, uh, tensions are coming up more. Let's look at US and China, which are the two hegemonic powers. Do we have to choose the one or the other? The thing is, can, can't, couldn't we work together to be more self-reliant together on certain projects? Uh, I must say, I was uh, enlightened by uh, the description of all the capabilities we have, all the possibilities we have of working together between our, our EU zone and, and, and Turkey. Um, not only for both of us, but also for the older regions around. Uh, Turkey, as I said, is a, has a pivotal role. Now let's work together. And I am very glad to think of a next meeting ahead of us in Istanbul, because we must continue and business leadership can play a real part at the time of transformation we are going through. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Maurice, for this conclusion. So it's now my turn to say a few words before leaving. Dear audience, dear panelists, we, we had today a very interesting high quality webinar on an important country, player, stakeholder, as Maurice said, Turkey. Lawyers, businessmen, diplomats and academics from Turkey will be most welcome around our global D1 to strengthen links, cooperation and understanding. Let me share now some information about the Global D1. Our newsletter number two will be published by the end of this week with a special focus on Egypt, an interview on Silk Roads toward the Middle East with our partner SSF in Paris. And we, we have also to share with our readers an outstanding article of diplomat and researcher Charles Tepo. Uh, I uh, suggest you, you read our newsletter, you, you, will, you will receive. 
We will host in Paris, uh, launching even by the end of September, then in London and Berlin this fall. The Global D1 will meet in Kuwait City, invited by our chairwoman, co-chair of the advisory board, Princess Intisar Al-Sabah. But uh, we have a promise we will uh, hold to organize a business event with friends and maybe French and German companies by the end of this year or beginning of 2021 in Istanbul with the help of our Turkish friends, Mehmet, Ali, Muhammad. Webinars will go on from September again with the newsletter number three. The focus is not chosen for the moment. It could be Saudi Arabia, Morocco, India too. We have so many countries and regions to connect with. Our motto is connecting East-West leaders. In the name of the Global D1, I wish you a nice summertime in a peaceful world, but I know it's a bit wishful thinking, but we can hope. Thank you again to everybody and uh, talk to you and see you soon. And thank you to our participants to, to have listened to this very high quality webinar. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.